Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please. My fellow Christians, today we as a parish family observe the Feast of Independence Day. Now what exactly we celebrate on this day, especially as we celebrate it within the life of the church, is a matter of wide-ranging opinion. But in its essence, this feast is a commemoration of that day in 1776 when the Second Continental Congress signed the Declaration of Independence, an event that would launch this ongoing experiment in self-governance that we call the United States of America. It seems appropriate, therefore, that the observance of this feast day in the life of the church should be marked by careful reflection upon founding documents and the writings of fathers. So today, as I have done before, I'm going to preach the words of Quadratus of Asia Minor, a father of the church, an apologist, and martyr. These words come from a second century letter likely written to the Roman Emperor Hadrian at a time of sharp persecution. And it is my hope that by preaching this founding document of the church, we might better understand what it means to observe the Feast of Independence Day, and more broadly, what it means to be a Christian in America. So here it goes. Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or custom. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. Unlike some other people, they champion no purely human doctrine with regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general. They follow the customs of whatever city they happen to live in, whether Greek or foreign. And yet, there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were just passing through. They play their full role as citizens, of course, but labor under the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. They pass their days upon earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians, they love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned because they are not understood, they are put to death, but raised to life again. They live in poverty, but make many rich. They are totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. They respond to abuse with a blessing. Deference is their response to insult. For the good that they do, they receive the punishment of malefactors. But even then they rejoice as though receiving the gift of life. They are attacked as aliens and persecuted by their neighbors, yet no one can explain the reason for this hatred. To speak in general terms, we may say that the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body. As the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it, so Christians are found in all the cities of the world but cannot be identified with the world. The body hates the soul and wars against it, not because of any injury that the soul has done to it, but because of the restriction that the soul places on its pleasures. And likewise, the world hates the Christians not because they have done anything wrong, but because they are opposed to its enjoyments. Christians love 
those who hate them. Just as the soul loves the body and all of its members despite the body's hatred. It is by the soul enclosed within the body that the body is held together. And likewise, it is by the Christians detained in this world as in a prison that the world is held together. The soul, though immortal, has a mortal dwelling place. And the Christians also live for a time amidst perishable things, all while awaiting the freedom from change and decay that will be theirs in heaven. As the soul benefits from the deprivation of food and drink, so Christians flourish under persecution. Such is the Christian's lofty and divinely appointed function from which he is not permitted to excuse himself. My fellow Christians, on this Independence Day, we rightly celebrate the good life afforded to us by living in this nation. And yet, as good as this country is, and it is good, don't mishear me, it is good, we are called to seek an even better one, a heavenly one. For by virtue of our baptism, we have a heavenly citizenship. And that's the whole point that Quadratus of Asia Minor is trying to make in his letter to the emperor. When we pass through the waters of the font, we become citizens of heaven and resident aliens of the United States. Resident aliens, I know that sounds weird, but as weird as it sounds in baptism, we become foreigners to the very country that we call our homeland. This is the paradox of baptism. This means that our heavenly citizenship does not merely qualify our national citizenship. It transforms and redefines it, transferring it into a new political domain. And we can see this transformation and redefinition in our scripture lessons that we heard today. Just as Israel made a royal covenant with David after the death of Saul, so we have pledged our allegiance to the political domain of a new king in baptism, namely Jesus. And just as St. Paul was taken up into the third heaven, as he describes in 2 Corinthians, so has our citizenship been transported to the very domain of God up in the heavenly realms, again, through baptism. And just as Jesus found his own hometown to be a place of rejection, so has our homeland become like a foreign country to us, again, through baptism. And so, my friends, we are not merely Christian Americans or American Christians, rather, we are simply Christians who have an address in the United States because this is where we are called on God's mission. As Christians, our freedom is declared in the saving work of Jesus Christ. Our liberty is guaranteed not by a constitution, but in a crucifixion. As Christians, we are free because we serve the King of kings and Lord of lords, because we serve the cosmic commander-in-chief whose power is made perfect, not in our greatness, but in our weakness, St. Paul says. So on this feast of Independence Day, let us exercise our freedom in Christ first by praying for the welfare of this nation in which we reside. We do this every Sunday in the prayers of the people, but let us do it especially today. And then, if we might be so bold, let us in our weakness pray for the coming of Jesus' kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, in these United States as it is in heaven.